Okay, good morning to the very first episode of NATO, the podcast. Welcome to NATO headquarters. Uh, it's my honor to be the host of the show, uh, Benjamin Belling from Hamburg, Germany, and active in European politics on a very modest level. Um, my idea was that us as young people, we should talk about European politics some more and about transatlantic issues some more. And for that, I found a great team with other young people from Europe. Uh, so this idea was born. And today we will be starting in our first conversation. We have the honor to have Roland Freudenstein with us, um, policy director of the Wilfried Martin Center in Brussels, an expert on anything that is uh, European, I would say. Uh, and I'm also very happy that uh, my friend uh, Thomas Bellick is here, the co-host. He's the international secretary, uh, international secretary of the Young Christian Democrats from uh, Flemish uh, Belgium. I think that's the correct way to say it. Uh, and Just yeah. nice Flanders, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I, I hope we're going to have... Um, a great conversation and see um, uh, which topics uh, we can dig into deeper. So, welcome, guys. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Moin. <laughs> so, Ola, maybe my first question: uh, Where is Europe's youth? Uh, what are they doing right now? Are they are they actively working for Europe? Yeah, as long as they don't uh, do the Fridays for Future, I think, yes, they are actively working for me. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, jokes aside, uh, I, I do see a new spirit of involvement, a new spirit of personal uh, concern for politics, for the world, for society. And I think that's a good thing. Um, You know, there's a, there, there is now a, a burgeoning debate about the difference between millennials and Generation Z, the Zoomers, and the Zoomers are supposed to be the 68th generation of the 21st century. Um, okay, well, you know, toute proportion gardée, as they say in French, you know, uh, uh, keeping realistic here, uh, I do see a slight return to society and politics among the very young. And that's a good thing. And But it really depends which country you're talking about, depends on uh, which part of society you're talking about. Of course, this is not all the same. And there is no such thing as one youth, one young generation in Europe. One has to really look at uh, each case and each country uh, individually. Yeah, I would say that that's about right. I saw, I think I saw some information that uh, in Europe as a whole, young people do go out more to vote nowadays. I think uh, that's actually something that we're seeing, so that's quite interesting. What about you, Tom? What do you think about about that? I think what Ron says is very interesting, and spontaneously I had a kind of hypothesis in mind that might account for the fact that the youth is getting, again, more politically involved. And it seems to me that the past... 30, 40 years, we had a lot of, at least I'm speaking for Western Europe here, consensus politics, two major political parties, either on the right and the left, Christian Democrats, Social Democrats, who always were in charge. People didn't see much of a difference. <coughs> Both parties were, were, were in charge. And now for the past 20 years, you had a, a lot of other parties popping up, parties on the extreme left, parties on the extreme right, who want a completely different kind of uh, society. And you have youth who are motivated by the kind of ideas they have, but at the same time you have youth who are actively repulsed by the kind of ideas and the kind of society, the extreme light, right and the extreme left puts forward. So that motivates also that you, who in the past was like, okay, whoever's in charge, either the social democrats or the Christian democrats, I'm not really getting involved to get involved because now it matters more. For example, you also see that in now in Poland where a lot of young people are getting extremely involved because they are actively against the very right-wing uh, government, also now the presidential elections. And I do think that in a certain way, it's a bit weird to say, this active involvement of the youth is due to the rise again of extreme right and extreme left politics. Would you agree with that, Roland? I, yes, hesitantly. 
I would, I would just like to, to take the example of Poland that you just mentioned and, and come back to a point I made before. You really have to look at, at countries separately, and we're not all the same in Europe. And in Poland, I see very much of a differentiation, not so much along generational lines, but along social stratification and regions. It depends on the income group of your parents, and it depends on the region you're living in. And that will determine young people's voting or uh, activism behavior, um, also in this presidential election that we're having, more than the age of the person. So, yes, uh, generally speaking, you could, first of all, you do see a more, a more political behavior among very young people. I think we have consensus on that, and this goes across the board in Europe. But how it plays out, whether this goes to the, 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 uh, some kind of new radicalism uh, or the old center-left or the old center-right or, let's say, the, the globalized, urban, uh, uh, educated um, uh, uh, population or um, the more left-behind, uh, rural-based population, that is, a, that is a very diff difficult question that you have to answer uh, very uh, specifically for each country. And I think Poland is an example where in the last 10 years you have seen an enormous uh, radicalization in the nationalist sense among some young people. It's not true that all young people in Poland are... Uh, think in a globalized manner. Are, if you want uh, um, uh, exemplary Europeans or something. Quite the contrary. I do think that the most pro-European generation um, in Poland is the generation that still have some childhood memories of communism. Yeah. Uh, were definitely born uh, before, before 2000 um, and 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 grew up in a Poland which integrated into European structures. I don't want to uh, too much stick to this Polish example here, but, but it, it is important to see that we're, we're not seeing the same trends everywhere, and it's not true that all young people are uh, in a way progressive uh, uh, in, in the sense of, of internationalism and uh, a goodbye to uh, the traditionalism of some societies. That is not the case. No, that's, I, I completely agree with you on that. I think if you look at a couple of different European countries, a um, lot of very nationalistic political movements are pushed by, by young voters in, in some countries. So there is, there is a very high differentiation between the European countries, uh, what, what sticks. Uh, and I like the Polish example, actually, and I want to talk about Poland a bit as well. Uh, but Tom, you wanted to say something on that. Yes, that I... I completely agree with Roland, and that was, was part of my point, that you see both tendencies among the youth, and that is exactly what creates this more political involvement, because if there was no ex extreme right either to join or to go against, there would be less of a political activism, and even, for example, in a, let's say, a very, very Western European, Benelux country, Belgium, I think the, the youth of the far right has never been bigger than, than nowadays, and you have the far right really questioning the status quo when it comes to migration, when it comes to um, how to handle the justice system. And you see a lot of young people resonating with that. So uh, definitely not all young people are progressive uh, and are uh, thinking along the same lines. But at the same time, you see the fact that the, the, just the mere fact that there are those young people really questioning this, this liberal demo democratic status quo causes at the same time a lot of other young people to be more uh, fierce fighters of the, the liberal democracy and, and, the, and the values um, they profess. So this is the very interesting dynamic that plays out, that they, in fact, in some way, motivate each other to be both sides actively politic. So let, let's say, um, yeah, uh, Roland. Uh, well, uh, I broadly can agree with that. Um, you know, I have to admit to my own shame that while living in Belgium, <laughs> I am not following Belgian politics closely enough, as closely as I should. 
So I have to take Thomas' word for it. Uh, but it does rhyme with uh, observations that you can make in other countries. It is true that, that generally, yes, young people are getting relatively more politicized, not as politicized as my generation, if I may say so. Because seriously, I mean, um, uh, the 1970s, when I was a teenager, were a time when it was completely normal for young people to belong to a political organization, right? I mean, it was like, this was, I wouldn't say the majority, but it was absolutely normal. And it was the normal to, to distribute uh, tracts, you know, leaflets in front of school or stuff like this. This was totally day-to-day -day business. That is a degree of politicization that you do not have today. Um, not even on social media? Because, but because leaflets, leaflets are, kind of, are kind of prehistoric these days. These days, uh, a lot of politics is played out on social media or in yeah. spontaneously organized uh, events uh, and so on. But So, so if, if we talk about politicization, it is a different kind of politicization. Uh, it, it doesn't take place in firm structures. It doesn't. There's no. There's no weekly meeting of uh, of the faithful uh, and so on. But still, I do see a movement in that direction. Now, within this, there is a new polarization, um, which actually reinforces itself. You know, so one side goes more radical that causes the other side it triggers the other side to become well maybe not more radical but at least more forceful and more committed to to their goals so we have this kind of polarization which by the way is a huge problem for um center right and center left political parties because they don't find themselves on either side of this divide they can actually straddle the divide uh, which at the moment causes them to actually decrease in uh, in in strength and in voter sympathy. Well, so if we if you look at that and and how politicized the youth is, and I like the like the Polish example. I just saw a poll today that at the presidential election, the runoff, I think it was on the twelfth of July. Um, so just a poll today actually sees. Uh, Trashkowski, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, the more or less EPP candidate ahead of incumbent President Duda, just a bit, it's 50.5% uh, to 49.5%. But if you think back just three months ago, that would be uh, ludicrous to think that. I, th I think Duda was so ahead in, in all the polls running for re-election. So what changed? I mean, Roland, I know you have very uh, strong ties to Poland, so you know a lot about that. Um, what has happened there? Yeah, indeed. I mean, I lived in Poland for almost seven years, and I, I, I also, I still remember that country in communism. You won't believe it, but uh, you know, I know what it, what interrogation by communist police is in Poland, and you know, smuggling leaflets and and printing materials through the border and stuff like that. So I've done that. Sometimes today, when I walk through the streets of Warsaw, I have to pinch myself to 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 just compute that this is the same street where I used to flee from police or 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 do go to an underground meeting or something because it was a different universe. It was not only a different century; it was a different universe. Anyway, so um, and I I do keep in touch with with poles here, and not only here in Brussels, but in, in Poland itself, of course. I regularly go there now. So what has changed? Uh, look, um, eight weeks ago, the Civic Platform, which is the main opposition party and the biggest Polish, the bigger of two Polish parties in the European People's Party, the Civic Platform had uh, nominated a candidate who was very simply performing, uh, performing poorly. Uh, Magorzata Kidawa Błońska was the wrong person. She was not a fighter. Uh, she, uh, um, I don't know, she, she was, I think she was ultimately shy of confrontation. That was one big factor. And the other factor, of course, was the beginning of the corona pandemic in Poland, where fears were enormous that having such a weak health system, the country would be quickly overwhelmed. 
and we would get scenes like in northern Italy, uh, uh, in in Central Europe, and and uh, and, and of course uh, uh, a, with with a society which is much less prepared to deal with medical emergencies. Now, this did not happen, uh, but the fears were enormous, and in such a situation of overall fears, the rally around the flag effect was extremely strong. You know, the incumbent government and the candidate, the presidential candidate of the incumbent government, was uh, clearly the, the choice of the day for most polls. Uh, Mr. Duda, Andrzej Duda, he commanded a, a, a majority in the polls, in the opinion polls, which would have catapulted him back into office even after the first round. So there would have been no second round. Now, that was the situation eight, eight weeks ago. In the meantime, as it turned out that the pandemic is not hitting Central Europe so badly, largely because very simply, the borders were closed very radically uh, because Central Europe is is less massively connected to the world that, uh, than Western Europe. Um, because of all these reasons, um, uh, the economic effects started showing um, where where the 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 health uh, the health effects were not as bad as anticipated, and the rallying around the flag effect quickly evaporated. Then came the drama about the election date itself. The, the government was actually determined to keep the election date. The original election date was uh, was I think tenth of June or so. Uh, and and uh, they were insisting on keeping this for a long time until an internal uh, fight erupted in the governing coalition, which forced the government to actually postpone the election. Now, this gave the civic platform the opportunity to change the candidate. Um, and don't ask me about the details, but the fact is that at that point, they could nominate a new candidate, and they immediately grabbed the situation when their candidate, as I said, Mogorzata uh, uh, Kidawa was at, was polling at five percent, you know, for the election. I mean, there were there were other opposition candidates that were polling much higher than she did at the time, and at that time the platform changed horses, and they did the right choice. Uh, they they took uh, Rafał Trzaskowski who is the mayor of Warsaw. Uh, he's, by the way, a person very well known in Brussels because, I mean, he's been the international secretary of the civic platform. He's, uh, he's uh, been, been active in, in uh, representing Poland in the negotiations um, uh, when the platform was still, was still in power. Uh, he knows the European institutions very well. So uh, Rafał Czaskowski, I think, grew to form. He, he really rose to the occasion. He showed that he has the ability and the willingness to fight. He is, he is a, a, a very, very um, a savvy politician. He, is a, he, he has fine rhetorics. And so for all these reasons, there was suddenly this surge in support for uh, the platform candidate, Rafał Czaskowski, and and now he is uh, going uh, neck and neck with Andrzej Duda, indeed, for the second round. I mean, uh, um, you and I have met Trotskowski. It's actually uh, when 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 I had the chance to meet you, it was a meeting of the European Democrat students in Krakow just a, a few years back, and uh, and he wasn't mayor of, of Warsaw then at the time, but I think he was the candidate he was running, uh, and we had the chance to meet him, and he is quite charismatic, so I, I could definitely see him um, talking to people and, 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 you know, touching their beliefs and actually, you know, convincing them to vote for him. So why didn't they go with him in the first place? I wonder. I wonder about that. And the, the, the other point is with the elections. You're right about them, uh, them pushing the elections further back, but I actually saw a poll about that uh, in the Polish population where people said, well, if you they wanted to vote for Duda, like the, the clear majority for Duda. But then they had this poll uh, where they were asked, okay, what if the government does not postpone the election? What if they push 
of of doing the election during this uh, corona outbreak or this corona crisis and the polls shifted quite strongly about people said well, if, if they're going to force me in this crisis if they're going to force me to go to vote in the presidential election i won't vote for the government i won't vote for duda uh, and that those polls were quite surprising it was against many many other candidates so there was always this one on one if this person ran against Duda if this person ran against Duda and people just said if they're going to make me vote in this situation uh, I'm not going to support the government because they're making me vote I think that's that was quite astonishing so I guess people in Poland actually they, they take their democratic powers very seriously um, uh, I like that um, just just the, just this theory about it uh, saying that okay you need to realize the situation right now is quite difficult in order to go forward with this with this uh, election but on the other hand you do see that uh, there is some strategic sense with um, the uh, peace party pushing for the election because before there was a clear winner with Duda and now because of the late date uh, or the late yeah the late date of the election uh, it has become a close race so let's see but this maybe if Maybe Tom wants to say something on that as well, but just uh, a, a second question then. What if uh, Peace actually loses this election? What if an EPP candidate becomes president of Poland? Does that make for a shift in in poli uh, politics in Poland? Or is it just this one election and next time there are parliament elections again, uh, Peace will be up on first place ever so strongly? So maybe Tom first and then Roland, I'd like to hear your opinion. Well, um, personally, on, on, on the Poland issue, I don't think I have much new to contribute in addition to what Roland said. I do have another question to Roland about um, what he said before. So maybe we can let Roland go first, and then I can pick up with my question, if that works for you, Benjamin. Yeah, OK, with pleasure. Um, and I try to be short. A, a victory by Rafał Trzaskowski would change a whole bunch of things in, 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 in pan-European debates. I mean, first of all, in, in, for Poland itself, it would mean a huge defeat for peace, for the peace government. It would mean that, in fact, the opposition already narrowly controlling the Senate and then having uh, the presidential office uh, and thereby being able to veto every legislation passed by the Polish parliament. So this would basically mean that peace would have to compromise on every legislative project, um, which could actually tear peace apart. You know, I could very well imagine that this becomes an existential crisis of the party peace. You know, the Prawo i Sprawiedliwość, the uh, uh, law and justice, uh, as the party calls itself. And uh, the, the, the wings have already, at some crisis points in this spring, the, the wings of the party have already been at loggerheads with each other. Uh, so, so I could very well imagine a peace, maybe not immediately, but after some internal infighting, uh, splitting up. Much more relevant for us is the effect outside of Poland, uh, which is on, on this unspoken assumption uh, that many of us share, and which has something going for it, that Central Europe is more traditionalist in society, is more nationalist in their outlook on European integration um, uh, than, than Western Europe. And, uh, you know, people like, like Viktor Orban in Hungary and uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski in Poland have carefully uh, cultivated this narrative of a younger, uh, 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 economically more dynamic, but socially more conservative, uh, and and certainly um, uh, more patriotic Central Europe. Whereas in Western Europe, you have a, a, an old, uh, decadent, pro-migration um, and rich. Uh, but economically declining uh, 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 set of societies, right? A victory by Chaskovsky would destroy this myth, right? I mean, it's not always a myth. There are, you can prove in opinion polls that societies in Central Europe are more traditionalist than societies in Western Europe. 
But it is not true that the whole of Central Europe is more conservative and less uh, European in their mentality. There are deep splits within Central Europe, just as like there are deep splits in Western Europe. I mean, look, look at look at France with with uh, uh, with with Le Pen. Look at look at Vlaams Belang and parties like this um, uh, in in Western Europe. So, in fact, the differences between in, in, the differences within each region are bigger than the differences between the regions in Europe. And a victory by Trzaskowski would really blow a hole into this narrative of a widening gap between Eastern and Western member countries of the European Union. So it's going to be very exciting to see what, what will happen in Poland. Uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, I, I'm not confident it's, it's going to, it's going to be enough in the end. Because I think the whole machinery of, of peace and Duda is probably very very strong to beat. But we're gonna we're gonna stick to that. So other other topics uh, that have come up. Um, the Messiah has come. If you look at European press, Germany is uh, has the presidency of the European Council, and for some reason everybody uh, is talking about how uh, everything will become better now everything will be will be solved uh, it's just ludicrous if you if you look at the papers german newspapers if you look at european newspapers all of them uh, even even uh, and i looked at the international uh, international press there was a japanese newspaper writing on this topic just uh, listing all the things that merkel uh, merkel personally has to has to fulfill and will fulfill uh, in terms of economy and, and international order, topic of China and all of that. So, uh, Ronan, how, how easy will we fail with these expectations? I mean, that's just, nobody can fulfill these expectations. And I'm, I'm concerned about the backlash when in six months' time people will talk about this. Well, you know, we all had so, such high hopes and, and just a fraction of that has... Uh, become reality and now uh, everything is bad and terrible and uh, I think who's coming next I think Slovenia is next uh, they're, <laughs> they're just gonna have to to uh, clean up after after all these expectations have been shattered uh, maybe it's a good thing for them maybe it's a, a terrible thing for them but I don't know what do you think Oh, well, I mean, I don't think we should be too pessimistic at this point, you know. I mean, of course, uh, the expectations are enormous, and if you, if you add them all up, they must be disappointed. Uh, it's impossible to, to fulfill all the expectations. But then again, um, you know, if anyone actually can at least fulfill part of the expectations and solve part of the problems, it will be uh, Germany in the driver's seat, in a way, uh, and Angela Merkel as, uh, as, a, as a person, um, you know, and I'm, I'm really far from, uh, 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 far from slapping myself on the back here. Uh, you know, Germany, German government has made numerous mistakes too. Angela Merkel has made mistakes in the last couple of years. But on the other hand, um, with her relatively rational approach, with her no nonsense um, uh, 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 kind of uh, attempt to 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 look at the pieces lying on the table, as people say here. Uh, you know, look at the interests of all parties concerned and then trying to form some kind of uh, a compromise solution. I think she's been doing the right thing in the past and she will try this approach as well. But, it, you know, I'd also like to hear what Thomas thinks about uh, Charles Michel. I mean, he's, he's your guy. He's the Belgian. He is formally in the driver's seat. And I'm sure that Merkel is, Merkel is the type to actually coordinate with Charles Michel as the President of the of the uh, European Council and and not steal the limelight uh, uh, for herself alone. Well, I'm very curious to see how it will further play out the dynamics between Merkel and Michel. Um, from, from a Belgian perspective, at least, and I, I do think this, this attitude is shared to some extent internationally. 
the perception of Michel has not been that great. He's mostly perceived as a person who played political game in terms of alliances and in terms of um, doing the right thing strategically to get into this, this, this very strong position that he played that game tremendously well. But the moment he got there, he was also, to a certain extent, bound by the same alliances um, that prohibited him from acting very strongly. If you look at the, the fact that it's very clearly that Macron basically got him there, and he's also the fact he's from the French-speaking part of Belgium, the, uh, the ties to France are always quite strong there. So it was definitely a huge advantage of him, this very close tie to France, to get him there. But as soon as you get there, you also see that there is, um, as always, they expect something back. And then he cannot always act really properly as um, the head of, of, of the European um, of the European um, state as, as he as he should. So that's at least in Belgian position, but from what I hear in international press, that's at least partly shared. And because he's also from the, the Liberal parties, I would say speaking for for my my mother party, from for the youth party, I represent the international secretary. We look way more to. Um, Merkel, and of course, because of she, she's part of the CDU, um, and to what she has to offer at this point, um, than to Michel. So I think more people are looking with great expectations at Merkel than Michel at this point. Thank you for the confidence. Uh, so, so even more, even more expectations. That uh, yeah. no yeah. pressure at all, obviously. But, but maybe. <laughs> Maybe we should just, just make one one point about what exactly are the big problems that that they all will have to solve, Merkel and Michel in whatever combination. And and the first problem is to get a compromise on the recovery fund before summer. Uh, and and this will this is not a foregone conclusion. Um, I mean, my personal bet is there will be a solution. And as usual, what you're going to have is an overall agreement. On a couple of things, like for example the the, the volume, uh, like for example the relationship, quantitative relationship between grants and credits, uh, and there will also be some consensus on the criteria for the money to be disbursed to particular countries, but also the criteria uh, and the monitoring mechanisms uh, to which recipients within the countries um, the, uh, uh, the the money is dispersed. So on all these things, you will have an overall agreement, and then the bureaucrats uh, after summer take over, or during summer even take over and negotiate the fine print. Right? That's the way it's going to be. Um, but uh, what we might still get is a, a a new souring of the mood. Which, had, which went from completely dismal in March uh, between the North and the South in the European Union, between the, the frugal four and, and the uh, profligate uh, southerners, and then there came the Visegrad countries and so on. So there was a really bad mood in March. And I think then we, the pendulum swung to the other extreme, and it was like two weeks ago, it was also, uh, you know, peaches and cream. Uh, and I think we're moving back to some kind of uh, more amalgamated uh, situation where there is a lot of conflict too. And to not let this get out of hand, that will be the the main challenge for, for both Merkel and Michel and of course the other national leaders, uh, you know, to kind of fight for the interests of their countries while always keeping in mind that we need to reach a compromise. And, and that we all need to find a solution that 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 uh, is is fit for for everybody's interests. Um, and my bet is it will succeed, but it's 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 not it's not guaranteed as we speak now. Is it is it surprising to you that uh, Germany is not on the side of these four? Uh, I don't know the English term actually for these four countries that want to limit uh, the spending. You know, Netherlands. Austria, I think, is it Denmark, and who's the fourth one? Yeah, but plus uh, Sweden, Sweden, has, Sweden has joined them. They're called the Frugal Four because, the frugal they, four. because, yeah. because they're stingy, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Come on, I mean, all these are Protestant countries. <laughs> no, <laughs> Austria. Except for but, Austria, I have to qualify. Austria yeah. is Catholic, but, but they're, the Austrians have been special all the time. You know, <laughs> except the Germans. But you would think you would think that normally 
being the the biggest uh, the biggest spender in the European Union. Not saying it's a bad thing, but not but being the biggest spender in the European Union, uh, Germany. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't it be normal for for Germany to be on the side of the frugal four? But here it, it like Merkel has changed positions. Is it, that's that's the debate in Germany right now. Is is it a change of positions or is it is it because of the situation alone? So uh, how is how can we look at this? I was a bit surprised. Well, I I would also be interested in what Thomas really thinks about the German position. But but I would just briefly answer that. Yes, it, it is a huge change in, in Germany's position, and, and the reasons are multi, multiple, uh, like, like for everything important that happens in the world has several reasons. Um, and I think in this case, it is a, a keen awareness that you, you, you cannot lead from an extreme position, right? So for Germany to completely join the frugal four would make it impossible for Germany to lead Right? Because for leading, you need to come from somewhere in the middle. You can be a little bit more to the left or a little bit more to the right or north or south or whatever, but you cannot be on an extreme position. That was the big mistake we made as Germans in 2015. We put ourselves on one extreme end of the scale, and it was impossible to lead from that position. Anyway, so, so that is one thing. The other thing is that, look, there is a clear recognition in Germany this is temporary and this is exceptional. You know, we are not advocating a debt mutualization uh, over over unlimited amount of time. We are not advocating um, uh, a um, a permanent mechanism of of financial redistribution in the European Union on a massive scale. No, this is temporary. This is targeted. This is only for the exceptional crisis situation produced by the pandemic. So I think I think these things are, are really important to emphasize also in the debate in Germany itself. What do you think, Tom? Well, I do think that exactly as Ron put it very well, that it is the exceptional nature of the whole circumstances that can partly justify behavior and politics that are very different. For what example, what we saw with the debt crisis and um, to save Greece, basically back in 2011, uh, where you had a quite, I mean, still. Not extremely tough, but a rather tough German stance, um, which also had a huge impact on the whole European dynamics. And I do think it's obviously the, the wise thing politically to play this out, the, the, the exceptional circumstances. And if you look, for example, at um, the political discourse within the Netherlands, where you have a strong current in the Netherlands of your skepticism is put very strong, but still uh, being critical of the expenditure in the European Union. And a lot of pressure on on Rutte to um, to be as tough as possible and to really uh, remain part of this frugal four. But you also see that obviously Rutte doesn't want to be isolated from the rest of Europe, and he wants to keep the Netherlands as one of the the more more powerful and influential players. And if he keeps distancing himself by by being the most frugal of the frugal four, he knows he also has a problem. And you see then in him trying to justify the fact um, that the Netherlands is opening up a bit. He also uses this whole rhetoric of the exceptionalism of the circumstances. And I think this is the only card you can play if you are part of a country which has a lot of frugal tradition and a country that has in the past has always been consequently on the side of not spending too much. And But you still see that the only way to get out of this crisis is to, at this point, invest. Then you have to follow this rhetoric. I don't see much smaller options, politically at least, to get out of it. Hmm. I've been thinking that there's so much. I see that we we don't have that much time anymore. There was so much more to talk about this. So, um, Roland, tell me what what fascinates you about Europe. So all the other topics we'll, we'll just have to postpone it for some other time. But what what do you feel European? What what what's about being a member of European politics in the way that you, you as an analyst see it? Well, it's the diversity. You know, I mean, if it wasn't. Or, or let's say, let's say maybe uh, uh, pluralism of different mentalities, lifestyles, uh, ways of doing politics. You know, I mean, every day I go to the office uh, or or switch on the computer in the home office. I, I look forward to dealing with people who have completely different experiences uh, from mine, completely different cultural backgrounds. And, and yet we have a common goal. You know, we want to make this work. We want to... Um, 
to take Europe forward and not repeat the quite fatal <laughs> mistakes of the 20th century. I think that's, uh, for me, that's the most fascinating thing about Europe. Oh, I, I love that. It's a very, very German answer. <laughs> <laughs> Europe is peace. That is, uh, but I like that. It's, it's a classic. Uh, so maybe then, if, if uh, Tom, if you want to add something to that, but my last question to you would would be, uh, and I'm sorry that I need to squeeze it in this late, but uh, is Fidesz going to get kicked out of EPP in September? <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, it, I, it should have happened long ago. You know, I mean, we're way too late. Uh, I would say two years ago was the point when it should have happened. Um, Fidesz, Fidesz is, is, is not even a conservative party, you know. Uh, Fidesz is a party of a new type, as Vladimir Ilyich Lenin would have put it. Um, Fidesz is a power machine. Um, you know, it is using systemic corruption uh, to shore up its power in Hungary itself. It is, it, it, it is trampling on the founding values of, of, of the European Union, uh, but also, of course, the European People's Party every day. I mean, it, you know, just read, just one tiny example, read the speech that Viktor Orban gave a couple of weeks ago on the 100th anniversary of the Trianon. Yeah, I, I saw you post that. I saw that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, take that speech and put it next to any speech by Adenauer, de Gasperi, Schumann, Jean Monnet, uh, Paul-Henri Vispac, all the founding fathers of European integration. And there is nothing in common. There is not a single element that the founding fathers and their speeches and articles have in common with what we hear every day from, from Viktor Orban. Viktor Orban has a tribalistic picture and vision of history, of Hungary's role in it, uh, of, of, of ethnic purity, of uh, uh, the West declining. He really believes the West is declining and the European Union is collapsing. Why is he is profiting from NATO security guarantee and the money he gets from, from European funds? So, I mean, don't get me started. I will, I will, I will, I will not stop. I think that this party has no role and no place in the European People's Party. And it was actually, you know, many people are, are saying that, ah, then he would just leave and he will form a huge uh, anti-migration movement in European politics on the right. Well, good luck. I don't think it's going to happen. And I think EPP membership means a lot to Orban and to Fidesz. And, uh, and, uh, and they would not be as strong as they are now, if they were stripped of EPP membership. Maybe it would even be the first step to their undoing in, uh, in Hungary itself. And that would be a good job for Europe. And I completely agree on the, on the comment side, but one last, small last question. When it comes to the, the political strategic side, will CDU, CSU finally come, come across and, and cut the ties loose? Because obviously for, for your kind of analysis, it's completely shared in Ireland, in the Benelux, in Scandinavian countries, but the big factor has always been what will CDU, CSU decide on the end? Are you confident that this time they will make a bold decision? Honest answer, I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether and, 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 and when uh, CDU and CSU might come around on this question. For the moment, the attitude is that Fidesz is suspended, uh, that's okay. Um, um, we have achieved our goals. Well, I think the truth is that, as we see every day, every week, uh, Fidesz uh, doesn't care about the suspension. It is still active, and it can still, it is still causing a lot of damage in the political family. So uh, I, 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 I have no illusions, but <clears throat> I don't know what it would take for CDU and CSU to, uh, to, to change their position. Ultimately, they will have to convince themselves. Yeah, that's true. I, d I do feel that that Fidesz has or is realizing that it's it's uh, it's a big thing for them to be in EPP because other than the the speech that you mentioned for um, the hundred year anniversary of the treaty, um, they I they have been kind of playing nice. I think uh, in terms of of 
talking about Europe, talking about talking about Merkel, maybe, or talking about uh, the European Union. So I, that that's the way I I saw it. But you can you can prove me wrong on that. So I I do feel they're they're like on this love course right now, trying to convince people to keep them in EPP. So. Look, look, what, what Fidesz is doing, they're sending congratulations to, to the 75th anniversary of the, the birthday of the CDU in German, very smart. And at the same time, they tweet congratulations to Andrzej Duda for winning the first round in the post presidential <laughs> elections. <laughs> uh, <laughs> excuse me? I mean, so here is a, here is a big hope for the EPP with Rafał Czaskowski. He uh, has an unexpectedly good result in the first round of the Polish presidential elections. Uh, he represents the, Pol the main Polish member party of the EPP, and Fidesz representatives congratulate his opponent. I can't believe it. This is what we should look at, and not the, the, the finely, finely uh, designed congratulations to the CDU for its 75th birthday. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But if you look at it on a, on a national level, if you, as a member of a party, or, I mean, governing as a party, and then congratulating another party, that's, that's actually, that's, that's pretty damaging. That's, that is grounds for, for dismissal, actually, from membership. So, I know. You said it, you said it not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, still, record. I'm still not sure it's going to happen in September, uh, but uh, let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know. What do you think, Tom? Well, as I said, I, I, I mean, it's perfectly clear who is definitely before it, definitely clear who's definitely against it. So, as always, <laughs> and this is a continuing thread in this conversation, we're looking at one important Western European country that just lies on the verge of Central Europe, and we are very curious what that country and its biggest party is going to decide. <coughs> All right. So I love, I love to have this conversation. I could go on for another hour, uh, for another hour, I'm sure. But uh, we've taken up a lot of your time, Wuland, and you're a busy man. Um, I'm always happy when we have a chance to speak. I, I love picking your brain on all these topics. And there's so much more. There's Europe and China. There's uh, Greece and Turkey. Uh, I, really, there's that endless. I, I was starting to collect topics that we could discuss and this would just not stop. So maybe we'll have a chance some other time. Um I'm happy to have you again. And um thank you. Thank you for taking the time talking to us and uh keep us updated on anything you hear. Uh you are our first guest so NATO uh, podcast has started now and we couldn't be more happy that it was you too who was willing to help us out. Thank you everyone. Yeah, well, thank you, guys. Uh, thanks, Ben and Thomas, and good luck to NATO, and see you again soon. All right. That's uh, all the time that we have, and uh, Roland, you, we, we started this small gimmick when we, when we made up how this uh, podcast should run, that we said, okay, we want our guests to pick the outro music, and um, I talked to you about this before, and you said, uh, well, you know what, if I could choose it, Give me Scotland the brave. So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> that's what we're going to do. And uh, thank you, Roland. So here's Scotland the brave. And uh, have a good day, everybody. Let's hope that we that you hear us very soon again uh, with other guests and other topics. And uh, uh, keep loyal to us. Thank you. See you soon. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.